At this point, I'd like to introduce Major General James Sears Jr. to open our event. Major General James Sears Jr. is the Deputy Commander, Air Education and Training Command, Joint Base San Antonio Randolph, Texas. The command is responsible for the recruiting, training, and education of Air and Space Force personnel and includes Air Force Recruiting Service, 19th Air Force, 2nd Air Force, the 59th Medical Wing, and Air University. AETC operates more than 1,400 trainer, fighter, and mobility aircraft, 24 wings, 11 bases, and five geographically separated groups. It governs approximately 60,000 active duty, reserve, guard, civilian, and contractor personnel who train more than 293,000 students per year. General Sears, thank you so much for being with us today. Sir, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, thanks, Dana. Um, oh, always good to hear you, particularly after you've had your uh, morning coffee. Appreciate you bringing everybody into this uh, with that energy. What a, uh, what, a, what a great event this looks to be. I, I wish that uh, one of the things that I could do as the, the DCOM is have the time to be able to spend with you because I think that uh, the, the richness that's going to come from the presenters and the, the people that you and um, uh, Dr. Walsh and the, the team have been able to pull together uh, really, really was great to see as I got to look through. Um, I, I think starting with uh, Dr. Four this morning is going to be great as well. Um, the, uh, I'll have a couple comments. I'm not going to intro him, but I'll have a couple comments when I get to the end, uh, to talk about some of his, uh, his history with the air force. He, he may be uh, camouflaged by the army right now, but we know he's an airman at heart. The, uh, um, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting to hear when you, when you think of, uh, you know, a learning professionals consortium and, and what does that mean? And, and what are the, uh, what, what are the words that, that are in there uh, to mean? You know, it's my honor to, to get to kick this off, but I think that's something that we all need to, to think through and put a little bit of thought to as we go through. You know, the, the goal for your time together is really to build a community of knowledgeable, incredible, and I would also say committed learning professionals uh, to be able to work together to make the entire Department of the Air Force better, uh, to ensure that we're, we're you know, at all levels from BMT through uh, PME to include people's times when they're gaining not just uh, education and training, but the experience that they get as airmen uh, as they make their journey through the continuum of learning. <clears throat> we need to have people who are dedicated to, uh, to learning, not just for themselves. Uh, hopefully in AETC, we're creating lifelong learners with all the airmen that we, we produce, uh, you know, the 293,000 that, uh, that Dana mentioned in my bio there. Um, but we need to have people across the Air Force who are dedicated to learning as a significant portion of their professional life and how we provide that to airmen, how we provide that to commanders, and what are the things that we can do within, uh, within our realm as leaders in the learning community to be able to make that better for the entire Air Force. You know, the, the, if the, the goal was to build that community, you know, my thought with what we're doing together this week is, you know, that, that we should have a, a much stronger network uh, of better learning professionals uh, who will create airmen and prepare airmen to compete and deter and win if required, you know, in the uh, within line of the the national defense strategy that we're all operating under right now. Uh, yeah, I've already talked about it. we all should be lifelong learners, and the AETC puts a considerable amount of time in, in the early training of airmen and young officers to to develop those skills and to develop that mindset. And I think we would all agree that those who go on in their Air Force careers and, and are lifelong learners make better leaders, they make better followers, and they're able to execute and, and do things better as, as, we, uh, as we move on. So as, as you think about what it is you're going to do together this week, um, I, I want to put it to you in the terms that I do when I get to speak to commanders courses at, at various levels throughout the Air Force. Um, when I get to talk with squadron commanders or those who are getting ready to be uh, squadron commanders, 
uh, and talk about how it, at most levels uh, throughout the Air Force, up until the point of getting to, to squadron command, with a few career field exceptions, uh, we, we in the Air Force tend to focus on technical proficiency, and we are doers uh, for that portion of our career. Um, uh, there are some who get, you know, very deep learning and uh, leadership opportunities at the at the flight commander level, but but squadron command is really where the Air Force, uh, you know, that that leadership rubber meets the road. Um, so when you become a squadron commander, you you get to be a leader of doers, and that is a a certain level of of leadership and competency that you need to show as you. Um, as you lead your squadron and do things, and there's things to talk about at that. But when I get to speak to group and wing commanders, group commanders in particular, is where you make this jump from a, a leader of doers to a leader of leaders. And being a leader of leaders is really a very different mindset for how you, how you move forward how you, uh, you develop culture, climate, and uh, execute the mission. Uh, particularly in an age uh, with a chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, who we all know about his action orders, and uh, the Air Force A3, if you didn't know, is starting to, to roll out, much like the rest of the joint world does, um, five paragraph orders and using op boards and fragos, and, and actually using orders to operationally move things forward in the Air Force, but that's all under the label and the rubric of mission type orders. Uh, being able to delegate and, and move things down, uh, allow leaders at the appropriate level to make the decisions within their purview and to take risk at their purview uh, and inform upwards as opposed to requesting permission. Uh, those are all things that uh, we could have an argument this week on that alone, whether or not we've done a good job of preparing leaders to do that, leaders of leaders and airmen. Uh, I would say in AETC, we have made a big shift over the last year to be able to make that happen and to be able to create airmen who can operate within that environment and, and move the Air Force forward and prevail in the uncertain uh, extremes, quite frankly, that will be in the Pacific should we end up there in conflict. So when you take that model of everything I just talked about and you transfer that to a learning professional consortium and learning professionals. Uh, if all airmen are lifelong learners, or at least the, the best airmen are, uh, and if you think of, you know, the, the instructors, the trainers, um, from all the way from the BMT level to the PME level, those people who are, uh, you know, making sure that those airmen not are not only are lifelong learners, but they're being, you know, profitable, if you will, in, in their lifelong learning. Uh, I would hope that the people who are here today are committed to learning and are learning professionals in a way to be uh, the, the trainers and the educators of those people who are the trainers and educators, kind of like being uh, leaders of leaders. And if you t elevate yourself up and you take that view of what we're doing here this week together, uh, the experience you're going to be able to gain with the, the phenomenal guest speakers and folks that we're bringing in to, to work with us and to make us better learning professionals, um, I think it puts a, a good perspective on at least where I'm at with it. And I think it, it will put you in that perspective to not just think about the things that you loved as being an educator of whatever sort that you have been in the Air Force, but it will allow you to grow yourself and learn in a way that will help you help those who are just beginning that journey of being uh, educators beyond the informal things that we <clears throat> frequently do as uh, first level supervisors and early supervisors in our careers. <clears throat> AETC is, is really committed to making sure that as we produce airmen in our, our various uh, programs that we have from, from all the AFSCs through uh, professional military education, uh, to keep things airman-centric, mission-focused, and competency-based, uh, to be able to allow um, you know, learners to learn at the pace and in the means that they do uh, we focus it on the mission, not just what they know now, but what they need to know to be successful in the future. Um, and then we're, we're measuring the things and teaching the things that are required to be successful in their, whatever that next level is for them in, the, in their Air Force journey. So I hope you're able to take your time this week, 
bring all of that together, learn how to be you know, professional educators of professional, uh, uh, sorry, learning professionals of learning professionals so that we can make uh, the entire Department of the Air Force better as we go forward. Um, I've seen the data, I've seen participants grow quite a bit and chat grow quite a bit. Um, it's a little early for questions, but does any, anybody have anything out there for me? No, sir, I'm not seeing anything in chat right now. Yep, it's, uh, it, it's a bit early for that. Um, so I think what I'll, I'll conclude with then is thanks to everyone who is, has taken the time to spend with us today uh, and, and really learn where uh, your education and training command is, is trying to take what we're doing, not just with the, um, uh, not just with what I talked about being airman centric, mission focused and competency based, but with the technology, the learning tools, the ability to bring those things in, uh, you'll get to see some of our lines of effort, you know, in, in particular, how we're pivoting to tech training, how we're trying to create what Second Air Force calls uh, sixth generation learning environments of the future, uh, and how we're bringing data into some of those things. And we're hoping that, that we can use that to bring a broader portion of the Air Force together as learning professionals. Um, and uh, before I turn it over to you, Dana, uh, you know, Dr. Four, uh, hopefully, if, if he's on now, um, so glad to see him come back and, and keynote this. Um, you know, he, he's camouflaged, if you will, a bit by the Army right now. But uh, when I was a group commander and a wing commander, he was the executive director at the Air Force Personnel Center. So we worked together on a couple of things there. And uh, and then when I got to be the director of assignments and deployments uh, at Air Force at the Air Force Personnel Center, he was the AFMC A1. So we we've worked together before. And I appreciate that uh, we won't tell his Army boss that he's an airman at heart. But uh, I think it's going to be great to see him kick this off and. Look forward to hearing great things uh, about that. Uh, and with that, Dana, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, General Sears, for being with us today. We so appreciate your opening remarks. So now I want to introduce Dr. Ford. So like General Sears stated, Dr. Ford did start out his career as an instructor in AEPC, Shepard Air Force Base. He gained expertise in technical training and then moved on to headquarters AET, AETC, headquarters Air Force, AFMC, Department of the Justice, and now he's with the Department of the Army. He was and still is a learning professional. So he's currently the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army Civilian Personnel within the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Army Manpower and Reserve Affairs and is responsible for the human resource life cycle affecting over 290,000 Army civilians. He leads the strategic planning of enterprise talent management and sets the strategic direction, develops policy, allocates resources, and supervises all matters pertaining to civilian personnel policy to sustain and position the Army for the future. So Dr. Four, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, thank you very much, Dana. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Major General Sears, good to see you. Thank you for your comments as well. So I am not at home. This is not my living room. I am actually traveling this week and we'll get to that in just a moment. But let me talk about the purpose and uh, kind of what I want to do with you here for just a couple of minutes this morning. My intent is to really kind of spark your thinking as you start into this you know, journey that you have in the next couple of days about talking about learning and technology and the learning journey in general. Um, and then why is this really important? Uh, this is important to you because you are a professional learner and you have the responsibility of teaching airmen uh, of the future. And so it's always amazing to me uh, where out of the blue, I'll get an email or out of the blue, I'll get a text message from someone or a LinkedIn note um, saying, you know, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but uh, back when we were doing whatever, uh, you inspired me. Uh, and today I finished a master's degree and you encouraged me. Or I'll hear from someone that uh, was a student, maybe when I was uh, in air, uh, I'm sorry, an instructor when I was in air education and training command. Um, and they're like, you know, you taught me and you inspired me to be a good airman. 
And now I just made master sergeant. And I remember how important it was that you took a vested interest in me. So I just kind of put those things out there um, to say, hey, it's important uh, that you think about what you do as a professional in the learning environment. And that's why I think that you are participating in part of this event today. Let me talk a little bit about the route of what I'm going to do here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna talk about um, Never Stop Learning. Uh, then I'm gonna transition into uh, learning technology for just a moment. And then lastly, I'll talk about um, the personal journey uh, so kind of centered around learning. And so uh, I want you to think about kind of those three areas and what that's gonna mean for you over the next couple of hours. And then lastly, I'm gonna open it up to some Q um, questions so that you have an opportunity to ask me a couple of questions. So let me stop, start with um, never stop learning. Well, I'm at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill uh, this week. Uh, I am actually a student. Um, got my little name tag in my lanyard. Um, I am actually in a course that's an executive development opportunity to learn about data and data analytics to include artificial intelligence. Uh, so as a lifelong learner, um, I think that you got to continually grow as an individual. Uh, think about what it is that you are centered about, what you think about, what's important to you, and what's important to your professional as well as personal life. So let me encourage all of you to think about what it means for you to be a lifelong learner. Now, I've kind of tried to find a very quiet place, but I can't guarantee that things aren't going to be happening here. So please, um, you know, this is kind of like how we learn to deal with COVID. So there may be people coming in and out, but um, please don't let that distract us too much here. So during the course, um, you know, it was the traditional read, um, some articles, but what we've really done this week in the course that I'm in so far is really take application and put it into reality. So we go into these breakout rooms and we have an opportunity to talk about it, discuss it, and then bring it back together. And so when you think about the learning and the learning process, um, you know, is it one way? Is it two way? Is it three way? So think about the way that you deliver learning opportunities today in the environment where you're working. When you think about your personal learning journey, think about how you have evolved as a learner. And so they didn't have Blackboard or Canvas today. I mean, like we have today. Um, you think about the way that you actually use your phone today. Um, I don't know about you, but I never got an instruction, never attended a class on how to use my phone, but I'm actually a pretty good wizard at knowing how to make things happen on my phone. So it's kind of the exploration kind of type of learning. So think about you and how you inspire others. Think about how it takes self-motivation to be a learner, but also think about how you inspire others to learn. Also think about um, maybe some things about learning that are kind of um, interesting in the fact that not all learning is intended, not, is not intended for positive outcomes the way we think it is. There are bad actors who actually take advantage of learning opportunities um, to actually plant seeds and make things happen that necessarily aren't positive. And how do you deal with those kinds of situations when you identify what those are and how you actually talk about um, socially those kinds of events that actually occur in the learning environment. And then we all grow as learners. And so again, think about going back to that chalkboard, think about going back to that book, think about going to you know, the homework that you had, that you had to turn in, uh, maybe a written paper. So today, the learners, whether they're in college, university, some sort of tech school, um, think about those high school graduates that are now coming into the service and actually coming to your classroom. They didn't learn the way that you or I may have traditionally learned. They're using high technology. They're using delivery of many, many different kinds of learning devices. So I've got friends um, that today are attending college that when I talk to them, they have a Kindle. All of their textbooks are given to them on a Kindle that they actually then use and it is interactive. And so the Kindle device itself 
when they write questions, when they highlight, all of those kinds of things are sent back. And then the instructor then internalizes those and then has a discussion about what the students thought about the reading activity that they completed. Let me turn to learning te technology for just a couple of minutes. Um, I'm currently today uh, and have been for uh, a year or two now using Chatbot to write for me. And so today happens to be my sister's birthday. And so I need to send her a message. Um, and so, yeah, I did send her a card because that's just kind of what we traditionally do. But I also needed to send her uh, a text message this morning. And so I asked the chat box, write a happy birthday message. And it said, of course, here's a happy birthday message you can use. Happy birthday. On this special day, I wish you all the happiness and joy in the world. May this year be filled with love and laughter and wonderful memories. May all your dreams and aspirations come true. And may you be blessed with good health, success, prosperity, and a fantastic birthday. Hope you have a great year ahead. So I thought, well, you know, that's not too personal. So I asked the chat box, chat bot again, brought a happy birthday message to my sister. Happy birthday to my dear sister. On this special day, I want to let you know how much you mean to me. You have been my best friend and confident for as long as I can remember, and I'm grateful for every moment we have shared together. You bring so many joy and happiness, so much joy and happiness into my life, and I am lucky to have you as my sister. May your birthday be filled with love, laughter, and wonderful memories that will last a lifetime. May all your dreams and wishes come true, and may this new year of your life be filled with happiness, success, and good health. Cheers to a wonderful sister and an amazing birthday. I'll tell you, I'm not going to send exactly that text message, text message to her. Um, I'm going to edit it at some point. But I've been using Chatbot in my professional environment in many, many areas. I will ask it about research. I'll ask it to write a message. I'll ask it to write me a memory jogger. And that way I have technology at my fingertips giving me the latest information that's out there. So Chatbot is just one way of introducing technology into the classroom. And so you can use artificial intelligence to write. You can uh, ask artificial intelligence to answer questions for you. So you can learn from interacting with just artificial intelligence. Let me transition to back to your learner and let's meet the learner's expectations. I did mention a moment ago that the learners that we have today that are coming into uh, our classroom is a much different type of learner. The question for you is, have you met that learner's expectation so that when you start in that learning environment, that you can capitalize on their background and their learning experience to move forward so that in the continuum of the, the content that you're delivering, you are best meeting their mental cognition and being able to challenge them, provoke thought, come up with application. Um, so think about Bloom's Taxonomy. I would hope that most of you are familiar with that here today. Um, where are you meeting that learner in Bloom's Taxonomy? And so I think you have to be cognizant of that learner and that environment that they have been in and the experience that they have to, are you delivering technology and delivering content in the classroom that meets their expectation? So I would hope that would be one topic that you would have this, this week as you discuss learning in general. So let me then transition to my last point with the learning technology, that technology itself is an enabler. And so you must be able to be familiar with technology to facilitate being that enabler. And so let me encourage each and every one of you to make sure that you are on the cutting edge of technology, understand what it means for the classroom and for your learner. Now let me transition to learning as a personal journey. So for me, um, I've been learning in my entire life. And so the way I've learned has changed. I think I mentioned how I learned to use my cell phone. Um, the way today I use artificial intelligence to do writing for me. And so in many ways, and this is what the research tells us, learning is individualistic. A learner comes to a learning environment with their own biases and own advantages in how they learn. So get to understand what that learner 
has from an, a basic experience and then be able to capitalize that within your learning environment. So again, research tells us that the way we learn changes over time. You can introduce new learning technology, new ways of learning um, as you transition uh, in the classroom. So it may be that you record um, in some form or fashion the event, whether it's training, rehearsal, practice, or a live event. And then you use that recording in a way to teach the learner the process or the reaction that they should have at various points in time. I remember a number of years ago, uh, I was at a course and it was all about communication. And intentionally they put us in a studio and they had someone rush in with a microphone and ask us a very important question. And the challenge was, and they graded us on, how well did you answer that question? We went into it not understanding that was the task, but we came out of it being able to build on our communication skills to be able to then address a question that would come from potential media. And so I thought that was a really, really informative way of doing it. And you just didn't learn from my bad video. Um, we got to look at everyone's video that was in the class and we dissected everyone's video. So it was really kind of a, a, an experience that was very humbling. But at the same point in time, we got try number two. And then we all watched try number two and how much we all improved at being able to be stumped by a media reporter when they run up to you and ask you a question. And so let me ask you once again to reflect on your learning preference over time. And think about the learning preference that you have in your classroom today with the individuals who are sitting there in your classrooms in your education and training command. Now, how do you as a leader take what you explore this week and turn it into how you relate with cognition? So I asked that kind of question rhetorically, but I think that that's kind of the point of your meeting this week and the content this week is so that you have an opportunity to grow and expand ask questions, hear what other aspects are. And then how do you take that, whether you're responsible for curriculum design and development, or you're responsible for supervision of training and education, whether you're responsible for developing policy, or whether you're responsible for the operation of training itself, many, many different aspects. So think about that learning environment and your role in that learning environment and how you take what you learn in the next couple of days into the learning responsibility that you have within your area of responsibility. So I've kind of had a brief opportunity to say hello and give you some of my thoughts this morning. And I talked a little bit about that never stop learning, then I moved into the learning technology and then kind of concluded with a little bit of the personal learning journey. So I would like to stop here and see if Dana can facilitate uh, any questions that we might have out there. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Yes, uh, people are, have been uh, messaging me for questions for you. So, so I'm gonna read this one slowly. It's kind of long. What, what do you recommend to stay on the cutting edge of technology while not investing too heavily in educational technologies that leave the marketplace as quickly as they emerge? So that's a really important question, especially in a large environment that you're in and maybe a resource constrained environment. Uh, so I saw a, um, a simulation earlier this week uh, that was really keep it super simple, uh, but it made the point and it wasn't a great investment in dollars to demonstrate it. It was computer learning was the example. And they took an old Atari game and they had a computer set up and they gave the computer no rules. And uh, the computer lost, you know, 70% of the time um, plus uh, in the first 50 games. Obviously it lost every time in the first 25. And then as it got smarter and smarter at that 50% time, it was around that 70% success. So they used a real simple example. Um, that really, really demonstrated the, 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 the machine learning and how machine learning. Now, when it got up to playing 
um, over 500 games, it beat the computer, the computer beat the Atari game every single time. And so uh, it was really kind of a very simple, very cheap uh, solution. Uh, another thing that <laughs> I kind of do now is a lot of times before I do anything, I run to YouTube and I'm like, I look for an instructional YouTube video on how to do blank. And so there are tons of things out there today uh, on the internet that you could actually look, make sure it fits the application that you're, you're looking for. And then you can play a real quick YouTube video. Now, something that's even a little bit more mm, kind of interesting is make a little video yourself um, and then show that video uh, as a means of demonstration. Uh, and so there are, are uh, lots of inexpensive ways to use technology in the classroom. Uh, I'm sure that you could have a focus group of the number of people that are signed on here today and come up with um, hundreds of ideas of how to use low cost technology in the classroom. Uh, but at the same point in time, think about that learner. Think about what that learner's expectations are. You know, this is the number one Air Force in the world. And you're bringing somebody in and you're giving them a handful of papers and um, a question and answer book of some sort. And they're looking at you going, this is the most capable Air Force in the world and you've just given me a handout. Um, and so, yeah, think about the technology, think about the application and the lifespan of that technology and is it worth the investment? Thank you. Your next question. How can we motivate and encourage service members to be self-directed learners to push the importance of professional development? So I would actually start with what is the Air Force mission? How does that mission relate to what their occupation is going to be or currently is if they're maybe a, a five level student coming back and um, be able to talk about how important it is to be able to do X. And so, you know, whether it is a phlebotomist in the hospital and you've taught people how to do that um, in, in the organization or whether it is an air traffic controller that has got people's lives in their hand and their responsibility is to line up those airframes at the speed of which they need to fly to actually get to that end of the runway. And so be able to tie that mission of uh, their AFSC to where they are and why it's important for them to be the number one person in learning and being able to carry out the job that they've been um, um, asked or have volunteered to move into. So, you know, for me, I think tying it to me the mission and how important it is for the responsibility that you have uh, in being able to teach airmen and then that airmen be able to go out and perform their responsibilities for the mission. All right, so this is an interesting question. Where do you recommend someone start to becoming a lifelong learner and how can they move forward when life and work obstacles interfere with their journey? hey, we all have a challenge of work-life balance. And so I kind of think at some point in time, you've got to be able to be a goal setter. And part of goal setting is identifying those tasks to meet that goal. So over the years, um, I have done a great deal of research on goal setting and goal attainment. Uh, and so in doing so, you have to actually, no kidding, write the goals down. My goal is to run a marathon in the next three years. Well, what are some of the things that you need to be able to do to achieve that goal? Well, you need to have the right equipment. So you're gonna to have to have some running shoes and probably some running gear. Um, it probably would help some motivation if you had a buddy that would kind of, you know, maybe encourage you to run. And you're gonna start off maybe running a half mile. Uh, and then you're gonna maybe register and sign up and you and your friend or a group of friends that you run with now um, are going to do a 5K together. And so, what are some of the tasks that would lead up to goal attainment? And so I really believe that there are going to be things that are gonna get in the way of uh, potentially learning. Um, there may be things in life that uh, you have to uh, take care of from a Maslow's hierarchy, food, safety, shelter, before you can actually kind of, kind of then get to that cognition level. 
but I think having an overall understanding and a goal setting for yourself is critically important in that task that you have, uh, and they don't have to be in any certain order, but there are tasks that you need for goal attainment. So what is your goal? Uh, is it to complete a bachelor's degree? Is your goal to complete a master's degree? Is your goal to have, um, uh, to run a marathon? Is it your goal to be a triathlete? Is it your goal to um, read a 500 page book? Whatever that goal is, um, you know, have some small tasks that help you get there. Read 25 pages a day. And after you read 25 pages a day, you'll eventually get your 500 page book read. So um, I think understanding and identifying what your work and life balance and life challenges are is really insightful for you to set goals to be able to achieve the desired outcome you're looking for. Thank you. Uh, do you find that younger people are more willing to use new technology than older people? Or do you find that in general, most people are overarchingly willing to learn all the new technologies that, that they're encountering? So I may be kind of biased on this one because I'm old. <laughs> and, um, but I like technology and I've always been kind of um, stimulated by using technology. And, and, and so um, my, my dad's 93, um, he has an iPhone. He can use that iPhone. In fact, we had to be like, very cognizant about taking uh, phone numbers out because he would text and or call people just randomly. And so, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily know that age is the issue specifically with um, application or use of technology in life. Um, availability may definitely be a key. And so if you think about socioeconomic availability to technology and using technology, um, but I think it's relative and I think everyone is at their individual comfort level in being able to adapt and grow as technology grows. All right, people are just posting lots of questions here. So how do you encourage service members who want to continue to learn without relying on AI to do everything for them? How do you strike a balance there? So there are many, many different ways that you can uh, continue learning as an airman. And so whether it's professional military education, uh, going out and participating in various um, events. So I know that there are gaming um, parts of the Air Force where individuals are part of gaming and uh, we have gaming challenges. Uh, and so, you know, one way to be able to encourage airmen uh, in at least the younger individuals um, who are gamers is to encourage them to join the Air Force gaming uh, opportunities they see out there. And uh, there are also, um, I think, other opportunities that you have in the environment to be able to have uh, learning opportunities associated with uh, various technologies. And so, you know, think about being, I grew up in aircraft maintenance, a vast majority of my time. You know, you think about, you um, encouraging individuals to go get uh, an API license associated with um, mechanics and, and mechanical engineering. Uh, and there are online avenues to do that. Um, you can even think about other opportunities that you have across your at least 400 plus um, AFSCs uh, where there are other avenues that individuals can go learn. And it is a self-paced rapid advancement to a point where now then you're challenged because this is a new content area. And so um, maybe ask among some of your peers that you are, are, are here with this week um, to be able to maybe come up with some ideas of their own as far as how would you encourage and where could airmen go to continue their learning, whether it may be a lifelong learning in, in a work-life balance, or maybe just content within the specific area they're interested in. Dr. Fora, I've gotten a few questions asking about your personal learning journey. How did you get from an instructor to where you are today? What, what helped you get there? What thought processes? And so I've had different questions asking about that. 
All right, Dana, I'm going to try to make this short because this is this is about you um, as an audience. Um, but I'll but I'll kind of share my story with you. Um, both my parents um, did not graduate from um, a college or university. My father did not graduate from high school. He um, was born in 1929. His entire childhood was a depression of the 30s. Uh, he was the oldest son in the family, and he went out and got every job he could to be able to make every dollar he could to help the family put food on the table. Um, he's one of the most intelligent people I know still today. You can give him any algebra or calculus problem, and he can solve that without any formal education because he's all self-taught. Um, so it was from day one in my family, it was you're going to college. Every single one of my cousins have graduated from college. Um, I don't think I had an aunt and uncle before that that did. So uh, it was part of that generation where my parents grew up that uh, they instilled the value of education. And uh, so after I finished my uh, bachelor's degree, I was fortunate enough to become an intern, a Palace Acquire intern at Shepherd Air Force Base in which they offered tuition assistance. And I started a master's degree at Midwestern State University. And so I completed that master's degree. Uh, the Air Force paid for the vast majority of that. I just had the time commitment to be able to go there and do that. And at the end of that program, I had a professor and she encouraged me, she goes, this is way too easy for you. Uh, let me encourage you to continue your pursuits of your education. So I think I took a month um, or two to think about that. I applied to the University of North Texas they had a satellite program at Shepherd Air Force Base, as well as Denton was close enough to drive to. This is kind of where I got to know Dr. Angie Canada much, much better because we had a lot of the same classes. We would even commute to class some together. So um, we, we both completed our PhD about the same time there at the University of North Texas in, in, in applied technology uh, training and employee development. So it was kind of very, very related to the field that we were both working in at that point in time. And so during um, my uh, Air Force career, um, I had, did have the opportunity to do basic developmental professional military education, as well as intermediate. Um, I did the basic in resident at Squadron Officer School. Uh, and then I had an opportunity to compete for um, attending War College. And I did that through the developmental team. And I was a vector to uh, attend Air War College. I was selected and attended Air War College. Uh, and so, um, you know, from then I, I was fortunate enough, I had coaching mentors that, um, you know, pushed me along the way and gave me encouragement. And um, I had one specific three-star that was uh, very, very um, active in encouraging me. And, and, you know, one day he called me and said, hey, look, we need you to go to the air staff and we need you to represent and um, carried the torch of Air Education and Training Command in uh, the resourcing of programs and dollars. So I did that there. And, um, you know, being able to grow on the experience, um, you know, was very, very critical and important uh, in being able to kind of be the stepping, stepping stone to many, many other future opportunities. So, um, the, you know, my philosophy on, on that is, when a door opens or a window opens and you have the opportunity, walk through it. And um, if, it, if, it's, if that doesn't you know, end up being the part of the journey that you want to continue, um, create another door to open for you and, and transition to another um, opportunity where you find yourself enriched and challenged. Um, I, will guarantee, I, will, I will tell you this, it's, it's been a challenge for work-life balance over the years. Uh, you know, and sometimes you just have to kind of go, all right, um, I got to get back to my cardio and healthy eating lifestyle. I, I can't, you know, work from six in the morning till six in the evening and do nothing but eat, you know, junk food and not have any kind of social life. So um, let me encourage you to be very thoughtful about that as well. Thank you, sir. Dr. Walsh, did you have a question? Uh, thank you so much for your remarks and for being with us today. Um, I'm just inspired by you and uh, and how you've used technology. I loved all the points that you shared with us. And I was just 
in your journeys, have you seen some exemplars for actually sharing information? We have some great exemplars. I mean, this gathering is one of how we're coming together to share information, uh, efforts, challenges, successes. We have, I put in the chat some others, we have these instructional technology units across our bases that are doing amazing things uh, in partnership with our learning professionals, but sometimes those exemplars just stay on that base. And we're trying to, to share that information. You also mentioned YouTube, and we have an airman-focused training videos uh, within Mill Suite. Again, people are not learning about it, and so we're not collectively growing some of these assets or figuring out how we can support them, or if they're worth supporting, or where, where you know, just where we might apply them. And so I wanted to, you've been kind of all around now in several services and, and seen a lot of things and wondered if you had any advice or uh, input on how we could share information and efforts uh, more effectively. Over, thank you. Well, I really think the forum that you're having here today is one of those avenues where you can do that. You know, There are other um, technological ways that you can share information um, where you actually have, you know, whether you're posting and adding information and having an open kind of chat um, environment, you can create that. And so there are, are there sp specific technologies um, that you have where you can actually share content. Um, and, and some of it's actually uh, free out there, um, but, but you may want to do something more internal so that you can take the stuff that's happening at Goodfellow and maybe share it with the stuff that's happening down at Lackland or the stuff that's happening over at Keesler. Um, and so, you know, you might even think about just having a focused event that might be a three hour event where each party gets 45 minutes to, you know, share two of their applications that they've been working on or two of the real life situations where they've done something to facilitate the use of technology um, in the classroom. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think we, we have a lot of those sort of efforts happening um, here and there. And so, uh, again, this community is just amazing and how they're working together to try to share those, but they're also very, stretched very thin. So I'll continue to look and ask the question, but I really appreciate your answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Four. I really appreciate your time and energy today. It's really been a delight to hear your your, your unique perspectives and about your experiences. Thank you for your time today. All right, thank you everyone. And lastly, take advantage of this opportunity that you have in front of you. Write down at least two goals when you finish the end of this program of things that you are gonna do, whether it's professionally at work or in your personal life. And then a couple of tasks that is gonna help you to achieve that goal. So that's my call to action for you. Congratulations and thank you on um, this opportunity that you've got in front of you. And let me thank you for all you do every day to support our airmen and their families around the world. Have a great conference.